You're watching Deprogrammed. My name's Harrison Pitt. I'm a writer for the European Conservative, and I'm thrilled to be joined today, as ever, by Evan Riggs, who is a freelance journalist, and our special guest today, Melissa Chen, who is a contributing editor at Spectator World. Thank you for joining us, uh, Melissa. Um, Evan and I Thanks were both <laughs> pleasure. Evan and I were both uh, struck recently by a, by a, a tweet you did, uh, referring to the new atheist. Like Richard Dawkins did an interview with Unheard recently. And off the back of that, you said that there was a time in your life when you, know, you found people like Richard Dawkins incredibly stimulating, they, uh, they awoke something within you intellectually. But since then, you've matured, so to speak, and you think, <laughs> and you think that um, the, p the new atheists, though they may have had some important critiques to make of, of religion, or religion in politics at least, um, they were naive in imagining that a world without religion would be, would be a better one. Can you, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about what moved you to, to, to tweet that? Um. The thing that moved me to tweet that was actually the clip of Dawkins' interview with Freddie Sayers and Unheard, um, in which he seemed to have walked back certain kind of strident, uh, the stridency of his viewpoints. I mean, Professor Dawkins was known to be like the new atheist, like the guy that's that you know birthed the whole movement. Um, he wrote books such as The God Delusion, um, and was one of the four horsemen. And as my friend Constantine Kissin always says, he's like, we are all children of, of Dawkins, whether we, you know, we like it or not. Like, a lot of us came of age, I think, at a time when you know, the internet just started to be mm -hmm. really pervasive in the form of social media. And so these books kind of piggybacked on that technology. And a lot of the ideas really like, seeped far and wide. Mm. Um, and all these popular books, and you had Hitchens writing, God is not great. Um, and I think it's pretty natural in your youth to start questioning, you know, the, the kind of factory settings that you were raised in. Um, and so I was raised very Christian and uh, actually in particular the Methodist church. Mm. I had gone to, in Singapore, the schools, the good schools were, were usually religiously affiliated. So sure. I went to convent for like six years. Um, and youth is kind of associated with a time of rebelliousness, of questioning authority. And these books came at the right time in my mm. life. So right. For me, it was actually the selfish gene. It wasn't even, it wasn't even uh, one of the more like explicitly atheist books. It's selfish gene was not an atheist book. No, it was a book about evolutionary biology. But scientific curiosity was the, the 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 original kindling fire for you, and then it that that sort of took you on to the new atheist movement. Well, I went to a a, a religious school, a Christian school that did not. So I took biology at A levels and the S paper biology, mm. and at this school that I went to they wouldn't teach us anything about Darwinian evolution. Oh, okay. So he prefaced, like my, my, my professor mm. in, in A-levels, the junior college, prefaced the entire lecture with a, a, a caveat about, about evolutionary biology. And so when I, when, when I heard that, I was like so curious. Like, it's like mm. the Streisand effect. But when you, he, ca he caveated the lecture, I was like, mm. I'm gonna look into this now. And so I started reading a bit more and and so I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive real deep into this because he told me not, you know, he, he was just very careful about the way he was wording, you know, this is just one competing theories, that kind of couching of, of the, it just made me like want to de de Degrading it its intellectual status in, yeah, a way you thought exactly. was in a way that you thought was suspicious. Yeah, yeah. it was like, it was, he was trying to like, mm. you know, draw a boundary and just trying to for forbid that, mm. um, but very carefully, very cagey about it. Sure. So then I, I read The Selfish Gene and you know, by the time I, I closed that last, uh, the last page, I was comfortable. I should call myself an atheist. Like it was, mm -hmm. because it, the the house of cards. I, I actually believe that that creation, like that entire myth, was was the foundation of the house of cards of Christianity. And if that fell, everything fell with it. Accordingly, yeah. Um, and so I was very comfortable because of Professor Dawkins to call mm -hmm. myself an atheist. But uh, as we have seen, like in the last, I don't know especially it's been so steady in the last five years uh, the retreat of religion from the public space has um, you know should make any thinking individual kind of question their prior assumptions if they thought that uh, a world without religion would be um, a better one mm. yeah I mean I think it's just it's not even that religion is retreated from the public space it's that it just got swapped out kind of Indiana Jones style in the Temple of Doom for you know call whatever you want call it wokeism or or whatever it's just it's, uh it's it's religious in all but name and so you actually will not have ever i don't believe a non-religious society 
I mean, people people have tried. It usually doesn't go very well. Um, the Soviet Union would be like a great example, even though that was kind of a cult of one man. Um, Singapore, in a sense, could be considered a secular society, uh, but there's, you know, I mean, you, you've made a good point on this, that Singapore is kind of like Neo-Confucian, but it's not, I mean, is anybody really still practicing in the country? Like, is it still, would you say, an explicitly religious society in a Confucian sense or a Christian sense? Oh, yeah, religiosity is, I mean, if you look at many of the East Asian countries, mm. um, the brand of Christianity that's very popular in South Korea, mm. um, in Singapore, in, in many of these, like, you know, new tiger economies is is a kind of very fervent evangelical new agey Christian the kind that you'll find Hillsong and new age Christian pop kind of you know yes. take root in um, and it marries this like Christian work ethic with Confucian principles in a way that's very seamless mm. and it takes off and if you look at like where Christianity is growing, even in the United States, mm. it's usually these kind of immigrant communities from South Korea, um, in Los Angeles, where I live. The uh, the South Korean churches are they are a force to be reckoned with. Do you think this was sort of synthetically planned, like many things are done in Singapore, or is it just kind of a, a natural evolution of the Christian meme for no, the country? I, I I don't. I mean, it's not it's not planned. I well, you know, the the West brought Christianity, right? So we had missionaries like I think religion takes on a different function in a place like Singapore and the, the reason I say that is because if knowing that I'm Chinese for example if, if I tell you what religion I belong to whether I'm Buddhist or Christian already tells you something about class mm -hmm. already tells you something about my cultural settings what language I probably speak at home it's um, it's in a way it's a signal it's an economic indicator yeah. yes and, and what yeah. church you go to what school you go to is you might as well be flashing your, your country club okay mm. right and so it has a very different function um, in society and because the best schools are linked to you know the old like French Catholics that came to, to found certain schools they tend to be the ones that also have the highest economic standards and so people kind of aspire to these religious schools and sometimes you get preg pragmatists parents who are just like oh i'm just going to convert because mm. that's going to be my best chance to get my, my ticket kid. Uh, right it happens here as well i mean there's the, the school lottery you know so I, I went to a catholic school and i actually am authentically catholic and so am i so is my family uh, so i wasn't there was no sort of canoodling that went on there or anything like that but uh, it's very common for people to feign religious belief or families at least parents to feign religious belief in order to get into the better catholic school than the bog standard comprehensive up the road you know which may be closer sure uh, closer I, mean, I went to, to catholic school yeah. despite not being catholic at all just because it was a lot better than american public schools yeah, well, there you go it was safer there yeah. you go yeah. there you yeah. go no but i think it's true i think um and I, the thing i find most interesting about this um the rather low water in which a new atheism finds itself now as, as a movement it doesn't mean it doesn't really exist at all uh, as a movement is that th a lot of the new atheists people who are part of that movement all the people who were um you know on the fringes of it so I'm, I'm thinking people like maybe S stephen pinker and, and 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 other sort of secular liberals who agreed with it but weren't perhaps as strident yeah. as, as dawkins um and hitchens and and and, and the rest they, they, they overestimated the power of what we might call secular rationalism sure. to produce and generate and sustain a stable fund of collective beliefs in the culture which could animate people morally, politically, so that, uh, around which our political debates could be organized. And so it, when you have a, a reasonably religiously homogenous culture, politics is, is in many ways um, emptied of much of its fervor because th th there's enough in the culture that people agree on that the qu political debates fundamentally become a questions of how are we going to make good on the values that we already share. Yeah. And it, so it, the, the debate becomes a, r a rather pragmatic one about means, whereas in, in, a, in a culture which has lost that organizing horizon of religious ideals, which is, you know, finds itself confronted by a you know, spiritual desert in many ways and, uh, and moral anomie, all of a sudden, our political debates are about how can we refound our society on a new set of collective values. How are we going to create the new values that will hold us in good stead? And people like, you know, Dawkins, people like Stephen Pinker, assumed that 
all the best things about the Christian civilization, that they admire things like human rights, things like, um, you know, the idea that power should be beholden to something higher than itself. These sorts of, which are incredibly Christian uh, thoughts could be sustained by secular rationalism. We could, Sam Harris will say things like, um, oh, it's, oh it, it, you, you, you commit the genetic fallacy by saying that there's anything authentically Christian about these things. Sure, Christianity threw these things up, but they can be sustained in the, without that without those pit fundamental pillars and they've realized that you know once you un unmoor a society from that, that fund of values fun that, that, that basic fund of moral values and you and you say that reason is going to be the determinant from now on the, the problem is is that in the absence of a, of a clear set of ends which as i say give life to political debates in in, in, in the absence of that you can, there's nothing you can't rationalize because reason is really just a tool and if you have rotten ends or no ends at all and as I say, if the, if the culture is drowning in a sea of moral relativism, then it's going to be very difficult for reason to be of, of, of service to us. Well, I mean, we've also heard now for, I mean, at least 20 years that the, the new atheism thing has really been going. Basically, I mean, when did Sam Harris start his book? It was like the day after 9-11. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, end know, of, the end of end faith. faith. Yeah. yeah. Um, that we, we, we need like kind of a new, a new story or, or a new sort of guiding set of principles that will keep all the things that everybody likes about religion or about Christianity, um, throw at all the things that are that one individual, you know, finds but, abhorrent, mm. um, and then we can all kind of bandy around. And it's like, well, we haven't been able to come up with anything mm. in two decades. And I mean, even people will say like, okay, like maybe like objectivism, and it's like, okay, objectivism was invented in like the 1950s, essentially, you know, so that's 70 years. It has failed to catch. So what makes us think that it can actually be done. This seems like a belief in and of itself. It seems like a, a faith in, in reason above all. But, you know, I mean, it's 20 years of podcasts and, uh, and talks at Harvard of people saying we need a new story, and yet no one's been able to write even the first chapter. Yeah. It, it just seems like, a, it, it seems like a failed gamble to me at this time that there will be, that, that we're gonna like hold out and wait for someone to like finally get around to it. And even if you could, even if you could write this new story, what is your theory of change for getting it adopted? Like even if you could come out with it tomorrow, how are you going to convert enough people to actually make it be a serious, you know, kind of political or pragmatic force and, and do what you're hoping that it'll mm. actually get done? Mm. It, it, it just seems like every aspect of this is a, uh, a total waste of time to me. You're yeah, completely quixotic. Well, the, 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 the tech bros think it's psychedelics or sure. something <laughs> like that. Well, you know, that's their spiritual, and, and they have their pilgrimage. They go to Burning Man every year, <laughs> and they all microdose in the desert and think they're on this spiritual journey. And sure. I think, I mean, even someone like Sam has actually tried to to fill that void with uh, an entire book that he's written on mindfulness, waking up. Sure. Actually, it's a really good book. Um, but he has done quite a lot to uh, sort of promote this idea of, you know, using meditation and transcendental meditation to to try to access different states of minds and, and kind of fulfill yourself mm. spiritually. He, so he's at least attempting to do that, I'll say. Um, the one thing that's actually I, I do find interesting about the new atheist movement is actually how many former new atheists, when I posted that tweet, um, it, it seemed to engender a bit more discussion than I expected. A lot of former new atheists also joined in the conversation and agreed and said, it's funny, I you know had the parallel journey to you. Mm. And I remember that before the word woke really existed, mm. the concept of it kind of first showed up at new, new atheist, atheist conferences. Yeah. Um, and just to show you, like, just as a yeah, proof example, of how example, kind of, yeah. ex not really extreme I was, but the, I was actually not only just a new atheist, I yeah. was going to conferences yes. that these people were, were speaking at, sure. right? People like Jerry Coyne, the, you know, Evolution of Lawrence mm. Krauss. Mm. And I think the early, the, the, the first people to get a whiff that something was wrong mm. were the ex-Muslims. Because mm. at these conferences, you always had sort of former religiously peop uh, religiously affiliated people in whatever mm. way, shape, or form, they were going up and talking about experiences. Um, it wasn't all relig religion bashing. You also had, you know, well-known scientists, like say, like Dr. Mm. Carolyn Porco talking about mm. the, her Saturn missions or something. They tried to like diversify the content that way. Um, but yeah, for, for the most part, there was a lot of like, uh, you know, 
Christianity is wrong, here's why. That part always just bored me. Like, okay, if you think that God doesn't exist, now what? Right? Yeah. I'm always like the now what? Like that, that argument no mm. longer interests me. You can't, you can't, yeah, I, the way I, I, I agree with you, the, the, the way I've, I, I like to put it is that it, it's completely foolish in the extreme to try and organize your civilization around a universal negative. Exactly. What, what could be more foolish than like that? It's like anti wokeism, right? Like exactly. It's, just, it's why the IDW and so, fell apart. And that, that is another conversation. Mm. That is another conversation. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> yes. But that, that's a conversation that, that that really needs to be had because I don't want the anti woke movement to actually follow the same. Because it will just be path. another kind of atheist. P- p- exactly. No negative, I see. Yes. But, but on, on the woke issue, um, for the ex Muslims, people like Ayan Hirsi Ali yes. and actually Majid Nawaz, there was, it, you know, this like weird pushback that they started to get. Where Sorry, like, should we say very quickly, uh, Majid Nawaz isn't an ex Muslim, is he? He's no, he's a reformist. Y- yes, yes. But he would still go to these conferences Liberal, and talk yeah. about the dangers of Islamism. Sure, right? sure. Um, but he got a lot of pushback, and he got a lot of pushback for even working with Sam Harris. Yeah. Um, he coined, eventually coined the term the regressive left, mm. because what, what they noticed was that when it came to talking about this particular religion, yes. um, as Dawkins had also discovered later on, that for whatever reason, mm. this religion was not handled with the same objective, consistent lens that Christianity was. No. People were very happy to bash Christianity. Mm. Uh, to to kind of tar it as some sort of uh, knuckle dragging, you know, like anachronistic uh, in the United States, ideology, but exactly. Yeah. But Islam, which which was an ongoing hot topic at the time, I mean, this happened during the time of, you know, Charlie Hebdo, the mm. Bataclan. Th- this was when the barbarians were at the gate. That narrative and you know, strange death of Europe. All of this was was uh, very prevalent in the last, I, I would say like maybe 2015 for like five years, maybe like four or five years, mm. there were a lot of these kinds of attacks. And so the ex-Muslims um, and Muslim reformers, mm. they they had a lot to say on the topic, but they received, um, you know, the kind of pushback that we now recognize as kind of anti, you know, this was the, the woke kind of saying like, mm. well, it's you The know, protected class of people. Exactly, yeah, Islamophobia. Min- minor- minority like, status, that sort of thing. And yes. that's when a lot of people started waking up and mm. saying like, something doesn't seem right here. Mm. And so like out of this class of like speakers, like people like Peter Boghossian, mm. James Lindsay, mm. they're all atheists, but they kind of saw woke for what it was before the general culture, the, the wider kind mm. of normie culture saw it. Yes, so. yeah, no, that's very interesting. And um, I, I, do, I do also think that what, an, an, Attempts by that people like Sam Harris and Steven Pinker to try and f- fill the, r- the 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 lack of the void left gaping by the experience the Western experience of disenchantment to fill that with a with a positive message. So in Sam Harris's case, as I understand, it's it's a, it's a sort of you know re- revival of Eastern wisdom. He's he's into yeah. that. I've yeah. actually not read any of his books on that topic, but as I understand, that's sort of his you know pitch. We can fill fill it with that. And Steven Pinker, it's with Stephen Pinker, with it, books like Enlightenment Now, it's a, it's, a, it's a celebration of all the ma- all the material progress that we've made through science and the, 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 the Enlightenment and all that sort of thing. It seems to me that, and this goes back to Evan's point a little bit of, you know, we, these ideas compete within a culture. I mean, wh- wh- when you've got a very dry, dry well, I, as I said, I haven't read Sam Harris's book so on this topic, so it would be wrong for me to express a view on that, but, but I have read Pinker's book on Enlightenment Now, and it, it seems to me that it, at a time when you know we're going through this experience of disenchantment, you know we, we, we've, we've we've forgotten our ancestral gods and we, we're, we're searching desperately for new ones to, to, to replace them. On on the one hand, you've got this sort of um, you know in, incredibly uh, politically messianic woke movement, mm-hmm. which is spreading like wildfire exactly the point. through institutions, which, which is doing ext- ext- extremely well, which does make a claim on the human spirit. It does tell people how to live. It does answer some of the basic human questions, it answers them pitifully and badly, I, I think, and I think we all think, but it, but it does try and answer them. And, on the, and Stephen Pink is trying to ward off that with graphs and calculators. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I, I, that isn't going to work because the problem with, the problem with that is that without some basic anchoring beliefs, a world of unprecedented riches and purring efficiency loses its appeal because generations become accustomed to its, its benefits. And, and they, they, they begin to take you know, our first world experiences for granted and they want something that is, is, is genuinely spiritually, spiritually animating. It's often, people often 
reel out the Chesterton quote, um, you know, when people stop believing in something, that, sorry, when people stop, stop believing in something that they don't believe in nothing, they believe in anything, I think that's true, but I, Israeli has an even best one, in my opinion, when he says, man is made to adore and obey, but if you give him nothing to worship, he will fashion his own divinities and find a chieftain in his own passions. Mm. That, and and we're, we're, we're living through that um, post-Christian moment at present, and I, I think, I, Evan, you can talk about this a bit more because you've, 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 I need to, pl I can plug my own magazine as well there as you go, plugging, yeah, plugging you. Publish me. You've, um, it was filming this on Friday the 9th or whenever it is, but you've just published a, a piece in the Eurocon called Believe in the Believers, which talks a bit about this. And uh, Well, I think too, again, it, it's, it's the essay that I wrote is ultimately pragmatic. You know, I, I don't know if God exists or doesn't exist, but it, it's kind of beside the point because I don't think we're actually in the period of disenchantment anymore. I think that time is kind of come and gone, I think that basically died with the new atheism movement. And we're now in the period where you could call it re-enchantment, right? Like the, the, the hole has actually been filled. It's been filled by this successor ideology. And so the, you know, as you were pointing out with the reason that we're having so much sort of favor in the, in the public debate mm -hmm. and why these sort of loose coalitions cannot hold is because it's not actually the period of negation. It's the period of people deciding what they're actually going to stick it out with. And I think, you know, we can't sort of come up with this a, a new set of like synthetic values that people are going to that are going to it's going to grasp and it's not mm. even if we could we couldn't do it quickly enough so we need to latch on to something real and tangible that has you know if you want to talk sh in sheer pragmatism pre-existing political parties like the republican party in the u.s or mm -hmm. maybe not the tories here it's a bit of a different thing yeah but, yeah um you know at least any sort of right-wing political party that might come after the Tories is going to be probably, I think it's safe to say, very Christian. Um, and I think, you know, you don't have to necessarily agree with, with Christianity. I mean, I think it's a, there's a lot of beauty in it, but I don't, I don't have any sort of inherent belief in God, but that is the best way out of this mess. That is, I think, the highest probability of success is to basically say like, look, like, you know, if I have to be the lamest, uh, you know, secularist in the Christian compound, that's probably a lot better than being, you know, the, the worst heretic in the, you know, woke gulag that we'll all end up getting sent <laughs> off to, right? Yes. It's like, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not going to get my sort of perfect society. I'm not a utopian. So it's mm. like, you know, pick the, the better of, you could say two bad options, but mm. I, I don't think like an explicitly Christian society is a bad option at mm. all because you, you could say we're living in you know the bones of a dead Christian God, but like when when it was still alive, like things were working pretty well. There's, well. A, there's, there's a wonderful I, I, sorry, I just keep quoting people, but there's a wonderful Nietzsche quote on that, which is, matches up with what you said. It's it's one of my favorite Nietzsche quotes uh, when he says, um, uh, uh, "Rather than cope with the unbearable loneliness of their condition, men will continue to seek their shattered God, and for His sake, they will love the very serpents that dwell among His ruins." Um, which is an extraordinary Nietzsche quote, which, which is precisely addressing this point that you know once we, once we lose once as a civilization we lose our foundational beliefs. This is this is what Nietzsche's you know, whole but philosophical oeuvre is all about. It's about, it's about we, we need to reevaluate all values and and we we, we, we need to. He, he was very optimistic that, that through sheer force of will we 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 could as a civilization create something, uh, you know, primal that could. You know, an animate us and redeem our, 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 the death of God, so to speak. But, but it has, has a civilization ever no. brought it back? No, no, no of course. And yeah. so, so you know, I mean, yeah. there, there's two aspects to this. There's religiosity, which is a personal relationship with God. How you know, how how a believer feels about their relationship with with mm. the, the Creator. But there's also you know theocracy, which is more of a, a system of of can the government encourage or mm. or uh, put in place you know, policies or institutions or encourage the formation of institutions that that encourage that, you know, more in a top down way. Mm. And so which one was it that you were I, I don't I don't for? think though. I, I don't think that they actually can I don't think you can consciously bring these about. Um, you know, what's I'll, I'll play a quote right back to you. What's the uh, Carl Jung? You know, people don't have ideas, ideas have people and it's like, you know, if if we could just sort of create our own values, like Nietzsche says, like if we could become um Know, an ubermensch in, in this way, yes. um, we would have done so. To, to, to be clear, I mean, Nietzsche thought that it would it would be one, well, it would be a small minority of supreme individuals who would do it, and that the plebs would follow. He didn't. He certainly didn't think it was a sort of democratic civilizational project. Everyone creating their own their own values. But yeah, he thought that there were people it would be people extraordinary enough to take up that burden. 
Uh, but he hasn't been proved right. Um, well, I think there have been some extraordinary people who did try to create their own values. I mean, Lenin would be a great example. Sure. That went well. But it didn't go, no, well, yeah. <laughs> didn't, exactly, that's the point. It didn't go very well. You know what I mean? It's like you're just not going to be able to, mm. I mean, going back to Dawkins, you know, if we, if we want to talk about how memes kind of travel through host populations, you know, Christianity is, is evolved. And we have evolved actually alongside Christianity. I mean, human beings have evolved to be religious. And in the West, you know, people who have been Christians have been marrying and having kids with other Christians for 2,000 plus years, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, so this is this is of us. It, it predates the West. It, you know, the West comes out of it. You know, it, it's baked into everything around us. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you don't have to think that there is a, a literal God to realize that mm -hmm. and acknowledge that and say like, you know, I think it's time for a little bit of humility for, for people like myself who like, I don't think that, you know, I don't have a faith because I'm so much smarter or more rational or reasonable. I think it's just basically just bad luck. I just grew up in an atheist household, but just uh, uh, mm. a completely a religious household. Yes. And I think, you know, so there, there's kind of that sense that's, that's missing, but recognize that you're actually missing something. Mm. You know, there's probably something about this I'm not getting, um, rather than thinking like, you know, you've got all the answers and it's everybody who built everything around me that was just wrong about everything. Mm. It doesn't, I mean, uh, I don't know. I'm a little too self-effacing for that. Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I ask you a question very quickly? Are, are you, are you, so you obviously had this, I don't, I don't know whether you'd call it a rebellious period, but you, you certainly went against your, the, 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 the belief. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, are you nervous about the prospect that increasingly, particularly in the United States and perhaps in Britain, uh, re religiosity is going to define the political right a little bit more? Would that put you off at all? As, or, 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 or have you, have you uh, yeah. Um, I guess I did see, you know, she recently saw some um, articles about how um, in Texas, I believe that like uh, a third of Americans wanted to bring religion back to public schools. Um, yeah. I, I do think that we, we need some sort of um, bulwark against mm some of the rewiring that has been going on in society. So the, the thing that Christianity in particular, since we're talking about this context, brings is a set of, well, it's a metaphysic, but it's also a set of rules that dictate you know, relationships, that dictate um, the ideal, uh, you know, their, their uh, social kind of relationships that are under assault mm. right now, especially mm. in the US. Um, you see that with gender ideology. Um, you see that with uh, even like critical race theory that is extremely racially divisive and, and quite in opposition to you know the kind of um, ultimately the, the the kind of pluralism and, and equality that that say like a, a figure like Jesus Christ mm -hmm. preached. Um, and one of the things that I think I've spoken to you about this before is that I see woke quote unquote wokeness as as an as a ideology that rewires hierarchies so so it asks you know s students to turn on their teachers mm -hmm. it asks uh, young children to subvert their parents right so even the traditional relationships are that have hierarchy gradients mm -hmm. those gradients are being res are dissolved mm -hmm. and being replaced by new ones and so you're you're now seeing in schools in America where teachers are, are being told if a child starts to question their gender identity you hide it from the parents mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. you know yes. and and we're sitting here <laughs> like it's fine there <laughs> why are we not on the streets and, and, and efforts and efforts legislative efforts of the sort led by people like Rhonda Sanders in Florida saying you know that shouldn't be allowed shouldn't he, be. here's an eight-page bill saying you can't bloody do that in public schools exactly. he's the extremist exactly. which, 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 is, which is which is the extraordinary thing I, I sense in that in your language that do you think that wokeism to that in the way that's trying to re, re as you put it rewire hierarchies and, and it turns instead of turning um, you know deference into a central determining value it turns sort of transgression into a central determining value do you think that there, there are some really some interesting parallels to be explored between the great awakening in, 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 in the West and the, and, and the far more bloody cultural revolution through, oh, which, through which China went in the 60s and 70s? Mm. Absolutely. It, it's yeah, actually the same kind yeah, of root. Same idea, I mean, isn't it? Exactly. I mean, this is Rebelling against parents, but all teachers. Exactly. Uh, or, or the past. Professors. Uh, or the past. Like, social shaming. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So, you know, 
in if, in in a society like say if, it, if we were talking about the context of Singapore, I would say because it's such a pragmatic kind of Confucian culture, at least you had that as a bulwark. Mm. Um, in the Middle East, you have Islam. Well, in the West, it's probably going to be Christianity. Mm -hmm. there, there is not anything yes. that is going to be a, a, a better bulwark. <laughs> We're not going to become Buddhists. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, this is, this is why you know, I, I've been bringing up Singapore for years, because it's like, if you don't want to go back to Christianity, okay, then I think you basically need to become as sort of efficiently pragmatic as Singapore and, and as Lee Kuan Yew, and that often and that's it means a and that often means a little bit more yeah. authoritarian. Yeah, for, 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 for that reason, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but this is interesting because one of this connects very well with exactly the reason why the founders of, of America, despite the fact that many of them, not all of them, as often overstated, but many of them were, you know, either deists or otherwise sure. disparaging towards religion, and they were all they were all pretty disparaging towards Catholicism. Certainly, um, they still nevertheless saw that. You know, b because in many ways the United States was set set up around the principle of limited government. Yeah. Limited government only works in a situation where you c you trust that within the population at large there is enough in the way of religious belief such that people will be able to govern themselves. And so I think I can't remember if it's James Madison or Alexander Hamilton, but one of the founders said said you know th 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 this um, said that. Um, uh, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If men were devils, no government would be sufficient. Mm. Like religion is very good at making sure that that medium between being an angelic, which no one is, and diabolical, which we all can be, is you know, <laughs> well, I don't know actually. Some of us I don't know. Okay, can can be maintained. Uh, but otherwise, if you if you get rid of that religious structure within which people are able to be self-governing. You get more chaos, and you, yeah. you you get more relativism, and it's and it's and it's and it's, and it's in that context that tyrants emerge. Sure, and I, I think it was Adams too who said that you know this constitution was written yeah. for religious that moral was people, and, it's and no, it, it was never meant for any other. Not suited for anybody else, yeah. but it's also like, I mean, let's be real. Like being a, a deist in 1776 is a lot different than being a, a deist or an atheist in 2023. I mean, you're just so much more tightly tied to that that sort of Christian heritage because you're so because you're so in a minority yeah, yeah. It, it's and I mean I don't know I I think you know we better the title of my essay is called believe in the believers and we better you know hope to God that they can they can pull this out mm. because you know as this is sort of the clarion call that I keep banging on about is like I, I do get really worried about what will happen if sort of that Christian ethic goes away and then people have to get you know ruthlessly pragmatic about you know how they're going to improve their living situations. Um, I think that's, who, who was it? I think it was even Hitchens who said something like, you know, um, you know, eventually basically everybody realizes that they have to stop being afraid of the dark, you know, talking about. This, this Christopher Hitchens. Yeah, so. yeah, talking about, you know, his kind of like, eventually, you know, we're all gonna have to grow up and become atheists. I'm butchering the quote a little bit, but it's like, we should be afraid of the dark. Mm. Like that's actually coming back in like a big way. It's creeping in on the edges here and, and I mean, obviously I'm speaking metaphorically, but it's like, we should absolutely, you know, like Chester and said, like we shouldn't be tearing down these fences unless we know what it was keeping out. Mm. And I think we're starting to see that in parts of America. And I think, you know, we're hopefully not going to see that in England. I'm a little bit more hopeful for, mm. for the UK, but you know, I think we've torn down a lot of the sort of guiding mm. uh, religious superstructure around us. Mm. And, and, you know, we're kind of off the edge of the map. and. You know that's where that's where the dragons and the monsters are, and I I, I really would prefer not to run into any of them. No, no, it, it, it would be better. Can I just very quickly before we finish, because I th I think our British viewers will be interested to hear this. Um, I've heard you talk very eloquently before about so uh, in many ways we don't want to become like Singapore. I'm a, well, I I wouldn't. I I, I like the Anglo-American tr tradition of limited limited government but I think it needs a strong moral fiber in order for it to be possible mm -hmm. and if it doesn't then you probably do need to be a little bit more but one thing that Singapore is very good at is managing its its diversity as I understand in, in a way that we're struggling to do in, in Britain because diversity it turns out it, is, it isn't as much of a strength as the mayor of London makes out it is <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it, it's a challenge and it needs to be managed but Singapore is very good at, at making sure that um, you know the, the fact that it is a very um, you know, uh, diverse population doesn't create ghettoization. I mean, h how does it do that? And how do you think that European countries, which are increasingly, due to their own foolishness, having to contend with this issue, how do you think that can be? What can we learn from Singapore on, on, on that front? Well, I, th I think a lot of Westerners are uncomfortable with the Singapore model because of how paternalistic the state is. It really is a nanny state, and it's a very, very strong. The government's you know tentacles are 
in almost every aspect of life. And yeah. so in a way, it's, it's anathema to kind of the Western civic mindset. Mm. Um, but its outcomes are in many ways um, something of um, marvel today. Mm. I mean, yes. this is a country that when it firstly did not even want to be independent, also mm. she probably one of the only countries that was like reluctantly uh, you know, ejected from yeah. its colonial Begging to stay. Pro yeah, yeah. <laughs> project, <laughs> um, and which which also is is kind of an interesting um, side piece to this because um, when uh, Lee Kuan Yew was was going to take the helm of the country, he was told by an economic advisor, a Dutch economist, he said, "You got to do two things. Uh, you have to eliminate the communists if you want to be successful economically. The second thing you have to do is." There's a statue of Sir Stanford Raffles standing there mm -hmm. in the center of your city. Do not tear it down. Mm. Do not tear it down. And Lee Kuan Yew said, yeah, I have no intention. I, it's, it's a brash move. It costs nothing. Mm. But it signaled, to the it, it signaled to the international community that he needed foreign investment from that this is not year zero, right? Like Emma Webb yeah. wrote this great yeah, piece. Yeah. And actually, her speech, her speech at NatCon was about uh, against year zero. This is not your zero. We are n we're not going to descend into ethnic strife. We accept the the benefits of British uh, honor the British legacy, and, yeah. and, and yeah. but we'll we'll change from it. But we'll sure. build on it, right? Yeah. It's a very important. You compare this to to there were several countries that gained independence roughly at the same time from the British, yeah. Jamaica, like say like um the other one was uh, Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe and all these others, yeah. yeah. They ran the opposite way, mm. and I think you can see how history has, has treated everybody. I mean, I would say there's a good argument that Singapore today is more proud of its British heritage than Britain. Britain. Is. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. it's actually true. What are you laughing at? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> no, it uh, is. It, it it's is. certainly true in terms of the people who are at the helm. I, I think that the, I think I think we still have uh, the, the, the sublime instincts of an ancient of an ancient people at large within the population, but that there's very little representation of that in in Westminster at least, but yeah, th th there's some truth to that. But on the immigration point, sorry, yeah, how, sorry. how does Singapore deal with the ghettoization? Well, there's no ghetto. Well, sorry, how does it prevent ghettoization? Um, That's what I meant. So instead of a, a situation where you have freedom of association once you've immigrated into the country, um, mm. in Singapore the, the racial quotas are kept um, the same. So 80% live in public housing. Mm. So you know, by and large, quite a socialist policy. Yeah. Um, and in these public estates, the racial demographics must mirror the overall racial demographics of mm. the entire country. Mm. And this does impose a cost, right, mm. in terms of, let's say I'm trying to sell a flat. I have to sell my flat to like the same race person. Mm. Um, so it's, you know, libertarians would kind of balk at this kind sure. of heavy handedness. What do you mean I can't live where I want to live? Um, but the idea is you don't get, you know, Clusters, you don't get like the kind of banlieues that you have in France or, or here in Birmingham, the, in, in, yeah, in Birmingham and England, Yorkshire and other places, yeah. or or the Durban, Michigan, right? Yeah. <laughs> Where like they just cluster and mm. they don't assimilate. I mean, the whole idea of, of building up a national identity mm. is that to, in order for it to be strong, you need to actually assimilate. Mm -hmm. Right, and this is this is like poison right now. Yeah, mm. uh, because Singapore does. Yes, it is. But like Singapore also does mandatory national service for men, mm. um, which they based off the Israelis. Israeli model. Yeah, and yeah. I, you know, that's very crucial by the way. But yes. unlike the Israelis, the women don't actually yes. do it because the f female duties to have babies, mm. which is yeah. not working out well so far. They should they should try to rejigger that. Um, but they do have a they have a clever way of going about it. But I do think too that they've kind of catalyze this Singaporean identity and into a you know a, an unbreakable thing you know out of this sort of multi-ethnic coalition because in part of that national service everybody at a certain point yeah. doesn't matter from top society down to the very bottom um, all the guys end up getting put in through this kind of thresher and they come out as Singaporeans right mm -hmm. yeah. you meet you go in as Malay but you come out Singaporean that's right. what it seems to me as right. somebody who didn't do it, obviously, yeah, it's 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 probably the best form of civic ed civic education in that way. Yeah. yeah. Um. And yeah, no, there are countries in Europe at the moment which are trialing this. There's a very good um, essay by our you know our colleague Rafe Heidel Manku in mm. that book there, fighting back about what the, what the Danes have done uh, to try and you know prevent ghettoization. They've they've been by European standards, at least pretty heavy handed. So hopefully there are things we can learn. Well, there are Danish politicians that explicitly cite Lee Kuan Yew yeah, sure. for their further sure. policies. They base it off him. I'm sure. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me in the least. Uh, Melissa, we could, I could do this for, for hours, but uh, unfortunately we're out of time. But thank you so much for, thank you. for joining us on Deprogrammed. Evan, thanks as ever. Of course. Thanks for having me. You've been watching Deprogrammed. We shall see you on the next one. Hello. If you're enjoying the new Culture Forum channel, 
and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.